everyone. Welcome to Disruption Forum AI Agents. My name is Mateusz Czajka. I'm Chief Delivery Officer at NetGuru, and I have the greatest pleasure to kick off today's event. So, according to Google Trends, the search interest for AI agents race skyrocketed over 900% over the past year. And I believe it explains quite well why we're seeing each other today, right? But it's not only about pure demand. We are actually using AI agents in day-to-day -day operations. We are building those across industries. In a short moment, we're going to hear from experts from Microsoft, from World Economic Forum, and 11 Labs about AI agents. By the way, if you are planning on building AI agents at your company, be sure to check out our latest ebook on AI agents topic. But let's start today's session with Rebloom, an AI platform enhancing, uh, enhancing secondaries market with Data Insights. I have a pleasure to talk today with Daniel Abdullah Bobruk, who is the co-founder and CTO at, Re at Rebloom. Daniel, pleasure to have you here. Likewise, thank you so much for having me here, Mateus. Yeah, great to have you, Daniel. So I would appreciate if you could share a couple of sentences about your background and Dribloom and what you're up to, guys. Yeah, absolutely. So as mentioned, I'm Daniel, CTO and co-founder of Rebloom. Uh, I come with a technical profile, kind of diverse, spanning uh, astrophysics, where I've been doing a lot of machine learning, data science, applied AI, then moved into venture capital, where I've been sitting in kind of the startup environment and trying to be a very small team. Uh, and this was very fortunate timing because this was about the same time where all the API solutions to these AI providers also came out. So this was where I then leveraged my technical background to, within the domain of finance to build a lot of um, cool AI stuff for enhancing small teams. Um, so I've been sitting in VC as well, sitting with secondaries as an asset, uh, also been sitting as head of AI in a spin out from there. And now I'm a co-founder here in Rebloom, where we are trying to enhance the private markets by using AI agentic tools on documents and for enhancing many of these sub processes involved with private market investments. That's super impressive, Daniel. Uh, I recall our first meeting, uh, not, so time, not so much time ago, when you mentioned that Rebloom is one of those net gen, next gen startups. Uh, it, it sounds very interesting to me, and I imagine this is somehow connected with the topics of today's call. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. So again, with the VC that I was working on at some point, we we're a very small team. Fortunate timing where with these AI solutions meant that we could suddenly build a lot of tools for enhancing workflows and work processes, meaning that uh, we could get away with being a smaller, more lean team uh, at a longer time. And that's actually something that I've seen in the market now being a startup founder, that more and more teams can raise their pre-seed or seed round stages and remain small teams because many of these tasks that oftentimes were laborious or uh, very repetitive or something where you could have a junior student helper uh, help you with that instead of having, for example, three student helpers, now you can leverage the power of agentic AI to cut down on human resources automate on 80% of the administrative task and then uh, focus the human resources on the task at hand, which, which are critical for human input. Yeah, it sounds super cool. So I understand like part of being a negligent startup is that you improve your efficiency by using AI tools, probably not only that, but simply adopting advanced tech, right? To achieve more with smaller, smaller headcounts, smaller team on having internal. Sounds super, super interesting. So I imagine for our audience, like because the disruption forum, we tend to focus on the practical aspects of implementation of any kind of technology. So it would be super interesting in learning what have you actually implemented at Rebloom, right? So just, let's just dive in into a couple practical use cases that you are most proud of and that you find very, very successful. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a kind of funny because it's a twofold story. So for example, some of our core product or proprietary product that we're building is applying agentic AI for document processing and specific uh, use cases. But at the same time, from the startup point of view, we are also using it for enhancing our own internal workflow. So this is where it's no longer proprietary. This is where we're talking about this next gen startup where uh, a lot of these natural tasks uh, where you can apply AI now. So one example, for example, would be that uh, for data entry. So let's say we started being a very small team. We still had a database with the with data that had to be first 
search for scrape and then manually input it into the database because we weren't as sophisticated at that point with the mm -hmm. wise. But now today we have some workflows where first of all, the scraping is not manual anymore. You have these browser enabled AI agents, which means that you are not even restricted to uh, text scraped websites. Now you can actually use a browser enabled agent that can read off uh, metrics that you need to use, for example, some market data or anything, other public data, then you can have it create the CSV files for you immediately. And then with a single line of code, you can push all of this to a database. So this was an enormous time saver where before, mm -hmm. honestly, it was so manual. It was reading off metrics, putting it in your table, and then finally uploading it. And this yeah. just really well for us. So, so, sounds very nice. Are you able to put some kind of numbers and impact? Like, have you measured the, the boost after implementing the agenting workflow? What, 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 what scale are we talking about even here? Yeah, that, that's a good question because we, we aren't really tracking time at that point being a small lean team, but I can just say from firsthand experience that there's a massive time saver, meaning that I can, instead of having to allocate hours at a specific time slot for this specific task because it needs to be ready to have the platform updated, where right? mm -hmm. I can just push a button that runs the flow and it's done within seconds. So, I mean, trying to put it at scale, it's a massive improvement in, in terms of multiples. Yeah, so like from hours to seconds, basically, we can say that, right? Probably. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And that also takes us to another point of some of this agentic AI assisted uh, workflows. So, for example, for coding, especially when doing internal prototyping. So mm -hmm. for example, a very, very mundane example that we had is that we have some KPIs, user metrics that we have to keep track of and that we share internally across teams. So for example, with the marketing team, usually this would also be either manual going into the back and finding the metrics, tracking them, generating a report, mm -hmm. or it could scope uh, having made an admin dashboard, which usually would take, okay, with take our external developers, we scope out how this dashboard should work, even though it's just an internal dashboard, basically, and then we get it built out and it would take around a week. Now, if you're just a bit technical, know some programming, and you use some of these AI assisted uh, coding software, then, then I had it within 10 minutes. And now we have a live dashboard tracking our KPIs that the team can just log into. So that was one of those low hanging fruits where you had to find out how easy mm -hmm. it was and then actually trying to do it before you had the impact. But I think that talks pretty much into the space with being explorative because a lot of these tools are something that uh, you are not alone with this pain point and agentic AI is so general that people are developing more and more tools for these very mundane tasks that the usual company would need to need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree. Like I think even looking at your cases, I think it's not a bold statement to say that basically every area of operations at startup has potential to implement AI workflows, agentic workflows into it, right? Would you agree? Yeah, and I mean, it's almost a necessity because being a startup, you're very, first of all, the full, the full fundraising environment, It's there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. So getting funded in the first place is one mm -hmm. thing. Then you have to be lean with your runway so you don't run out of cash. And that means also being a bit uh, lenient on the size of teams because you need to control your burn rate and you need to deliver on time. So these time savers just become kind of a natural step. And this this doesn't just apply to coding or, or for coding or for data acquisition. This is also for research topics and for, for marketing or okay. CRM tooling, for, for sourcing leads, which is something that we also do. So it becomes more of a, you have this pain point, you know, you have this uh, task at hand. And then you can almost go explore. I wonder if there's an AI tool for this. And then some might have a prototype. And this is why it's very important that you're a startup as well, because it gives you the freedom to try experimental tools. But um, but to but to be uh, what we say curious on the task at hand and find an AI tool for it, because the the availability of tools is just expanding so rapidly. Yeah, I would love to touch on, on this in a second. Uh, I think I would love to pick your brain on a topic because whenever we agree, like that's for basically every area on the operation of the startup, but there, there is a necessity to automate, to improve workflows with, with AI. Do you have any practical tips how to approach it, right? So imagine there is a, another startup that is at the beginning of this journey, right? And they want to follow this next gen journey how to identify, how to set priorities, which workflows, which areas should be optimized first. Yeah, definitely. So that's where I would say that 
uh, you have to look at the criticality of the data at hand. So for example, when I'm talking about using these AI tools, it sounds mm -hmm. so exciting and so experimental and oh, it's optimizing everything, but I only dare to use it on some of these repetitive lab laborious tasks, which are not as critical. So for example, I would never use it on uh, the critical user data that we have, but rather mm -hmm. if we have some extra additional data for displaying something uh, from a UI perspective, some public information, there is just about mm -hmm. volume. And if we lose it, that's more of a laborious test to recover it, but it's not critical. So those are the aspects where I'm more keen to experiment with these AI tools. And mm -hmm. uh, I've also learned, uh, in the, not in the hard way, but learned that you have to do a test environment, always keep it restricted to a small environment. So for example, yeah. uh, we have an integration with Notion, which is our document database, where in principle, you can have an agent across all the workspaces so it can access all the files, pages, et cetera. But rather, uh, that would be not so nice if all of a sudden you say, okay, delete this workspace or whatever, and it thinks it's the other workspace mm -hmm. because it has access to all of them. So rather, we have a, a specific workspace, which is the AI workspace, where here it can generate pages, it can create workflows, it can do all of this unrestricted so that if any disaster should happen, it would only be restricted to that uh, workspace specifically. And that's a general rule of thumb, I would say, about these AI tools. Never give them full admin control. Like, have it in controlled environments where you can bear to lose some data should an error happen. Mm, good tips, good tips. Thanks for sharing those. And I wonder, like, because I imagine there are certain areas where some startups were, might overestimate the potential of AI workflows in certain areas that are uh, they could simply underestimate the potential, like pick your own, start with under or overestimate, but I'm curious what's your perspective on that. Yes, and that's that's also a fun point because it's kind of double-edged because imagine when when the AI uh, wave came all of a sudden, you saw it yeah. at, its, at its worst quality at that point, and that's where everyone tried it. So that's where everyone used ChatGPT to do research, to process documents, do whatever, answer anything. Uh, without being critical at that point. Then you saw the hallucinations, you saw the low quality, you saw how it wasn't applicable to very niche domain specific tasks. And then that became kind of the imprint that you had in your head and your experience. Mm -hmm. And you moved on and said, okay, it's not mature enough, this technology. Today, there's some completely different tools and that's uh, specifically due to these agentic tools. So for example, uh, with research, before, if you told ChatGPT to find you some information, some market data, whatever, it could hallucinate some of the sources and give you some numbers which you had no source to back up. Or if you tried to back it up, you found out there was hallucination. While today, with the agentic uh, software that we also use, if you have just a bit of technical experience, you can build them yourself with these web scrapers, with these uh, internet connectors, etc. Mm -hmm. You can be uh, completely close to source material. So, for example, when I'm doing research. It, it gives me a literature list of all the of all the sources it uses. So whenever it gives me a metric or a fact, it gives me the source just by that fact. I can click it, I can go, I can review it. So that's that's an improvement going from the consumer friendly chat GPT without borders, yeah. going to the agentic kind of framework where all of a sudden you can restrict it and being close to source material. And this is a giant leap in quality that a lot of people might have missed because they tried the old. ChatGPT and haven't seen these new agentic tools and seen how we've circumvented some of these issues. Yeah, those are good remarks. Yeah, definitely. Like basically every single week, the progress is visible, right? So, so it's definitely like worth keeping up with the trends. And speaking about the tools, right? So, and another question I, I, I imagine like a lot of startup people have, right? Is should I build my own custom AI agents or should I somehow glue off the shelf products or, or simply use agen existing ag agentic tools, right? Yeah. What's your opinion on that? Do they make right? Do they have a preference over, over a certain direction? Right. So what I've tried firsthand was uh, back in 2022 when this space was completely new. All mm -hmm. the, Before it was even a term with this agentic AI, it was just yeah. AI. You had to build all the workflow integrations yourself, make them very custom. And that gave you the flexibility that the exact task that you had at hand, you could architecture it so that it could solve that task. An example was I built a Notion integration connected with our chat programs, which could write and retrieve from document bases, et cetera. And mm -hmm. 
to, to cross these. But this is a very uh, sensitive kind of setup because if there's one update uh, of the API calls on any of the connections, then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. It worked for your very specific use case. And what I've seen now, and it's funny you mentioned uh, Notion, for example, because uh, 2025 is the year of agentic AI and it's already outdated doing it that way because now there's mm -hmm. like a new tech standard called multi, uh, like model context protocol where all of a sudden Notion themselves has given out an almost like an API for LLMs. And now all the work I did is redundant and outdated because now just with a single line of code, it's connected and you can use your, your favorite AI software to interact with your workflows. So that's something that we're seeing a lot here in 2025 that these integrations, native integrations to, to AI with your mm -hmm. workflows are becoming more and more prevalent. And that's why we're going to see an explosion in a lot of these uh, workflow AI enhanced tools that are rolling out here in 2025. Mm -hmm. Sounds super cool. So it, 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 earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that there might be some challenges or maybe like some mindfulness needed around taking the right use case connected with data, right? Are there any other challenges, pitfalls you should suggest being aware of while deciding to implement agenting workflows into your startup? Yeah, I would say we have the liberty of being a startup, meaning that we don't, our work processes our workflows are pretty flexible. So we are always open to trying something new because it's not so ingrained. Well, if you're a larger organization, you have some workflows across departments where mm -hmm. it becomes really difficult to implement the change. And that's also why we see that even though AI sounds really interesting, if you go to the larger corporations, enterprise, et cetera, that are really interested in leveraging AI, it usually becomes like an internal chatbot or something where mm -hmm. if you want to do the actual agentic workflow optimizations like we do, that's something that require you to not affect a larger team per se. So I would say it's, it's the freedom of being a small startup that allows you to experiment more with these tools also because your data load uh, that you're applying it to is also more controllable. So I guess it's a matter about scale of the company and how much you can leverage AI. Because again, mm -hmm. your large corporation, lots of user data, it you can see how the risk reward becomes a bit skewed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I read also in the way uh, from the from the beginning of from your response that identifying a small chunk of the process, right, might be also a good step to to start with, right, and, and oh, yeah. avoiding some some changes and pitfalls, right. Absolutely. Again, with the, for example, the coding aspect of it, it would have to be down on feature level where you have to find some, you have to refine the task and make the granularity very precise because you can't just give it the whole thing and say, fix this, because that's yeah. where, where you, you get exposed to error and error propagation along the way, the more complex your workflow is. So always start extremely precise with the end kind of uh, output and then work backwards from there to keep it controlled and see like the chain of the workflow being assessed. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So Daniel, the final question about the future, right? So uh, during our discussion today, at the end of the day, I think majority of the cases could be called automation, right? Simple, more advanced, but still an automation, right? Do you see that in the next gen startups, we are moving ahead with AI, AI handling more strategic tasks and decisions? Yeah, so the, the term about strategic, see, that's where that's where my philosophy becomes kind of how much decision making should AI have, because I really yeah. like automations and the workflow, just handling objective data, etc. just a laborious, uh, repetitive task. Uh, I see it more also on the investment side that more than just being objective about uh, gathering information, some people are also using it for evaluating uh, opportunities so that could also be like uh, based on your criteria you could then start applying ai to take uh, not take decisions but kind of um, prompt you what you should be wary of and i think this makes sense while for the final decision making you would always need some kind of human input because fully autonomous ai i feel is is a recipe for disaster in my humble opinion uh, some people are into that, but I feel like you still need the human element and AI is just enhancing that. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for a super insightful conversation. It was great to talk with you. Uh, yeah, and yeah, thanks for sharing the insights. It was, it was lovely to chat.